Hey everyone, this is Scott from SyrupMedia.com and in this video I'm going to be walking you through the newspaper theme by TagDiv. This is a premium theme found on ThemeForest and if you're looking at this theme, you're primarily looking to build a newspaper, blog, or magazine style website. The primary benefits of this theme over many of its competitors, it's its unique cloud templating system which basically just allows you to import other templates or design your own and use them in various parts of the website. So for instance, I'm gonna open up a demo for this one called COVID Stats Pro, and it's COVID-19 stats. But let's just say you wanted to import the template of this statistics page, you're able to do so. So by using the cloud templating system, along with their demo system, you can combine layouts that you may see in different demos. But like all themes that I find on ThemeForest, and, and if you're not somebody who likes to go out and design it from scratch, I do recommend you install a demo. For the sake of this video, I'm gonna be installing the default Pro. You can install whatever style you like if you find one that fits your aesthetic and the look you're going for. The one thing I do recommend is that when you're looking for themes, try finding one that's the Pro version. The Pro themes have a lot of newer designs, they look more modern, they're not as cluttered as some of the older designs, they just look much better. Now Default Pro is just a really good way of showing you everything that's in the theme. I'm going ahead and I'm importing it and I'm also importing the demo content. If you're working on an existing website, I don't really recommend importing a lot of the demo content because you can use the cloud templating system to get the home page. But for the sake of the video, and um, if you're not us using an existing website, I'm just going to be importing all the content to show you how this theme works. So the theme sounds a little complicated at first when you're reconciling the demos in the cloud templating system. So I'm going to explain how the cloud templating system works just a little bit after we go through the default theme panel options because in the theme panel is where you'll actually be able to set templates that you have downloaded. So we're just now going to visit the front end of the website and make sure that it all looks as it should. I'm gonna give it a second here. All right, all this data is imported. So one of the cool things about this theme is any block or module used in the TagDiv Composer, which is their own custom built live design functionality, you just click edit and you can modify how blocks look, you can modify their style, and you can modify the width of the block. So what's cool is any block, say this uh, row element right here, will automatically resize to the dimensions that it's given. So what I mean by that is we're gonna come down and you see that I have this block right here. It's a three piece set of a big grid flex one. So all of these different grids and blocks are able to resize. So let's just say I change this to literally any other block let's just say I change it to the big grid five. And it went ahead and it imported it and it's styling and it fits it to the container. But if I want to say add a new container, which we'll do real quick, we're gonna add a new row and I'm going to demonstrate how this works. So in this row, I'm going to add a, this flex block three. Now the flex block three automatically resized to this container but what we can also do is do something like block eight. The block eight, as you can see, has three rows. So when you have, say I cut this third section off and I convert it to up here where there is an included sidebar, it now automatically resizes it. So it looks really good and it allows you to use any block in any position because they'll automatically resize. That's just something you don't see in a lot of templates on ThemeForce. Typically if you have a template, especially a lot of the basic ones on ThemeForce, what they'll do is, is say that you add, you moved this block down to its own full width line instead of being 66% or however much it is. It will just increase the spacing between the units. It won't actually add more rows dynamically. So this allows you to have a very customized and appealing style to really, really just customize how you want your site to look. I like this feature and I use this theme quite extensively on a couple of my uh, hobby sites, and I've never really had an issue with it from a performance point of view. But now that we've done that, I think it's time we start looking to the theme options panel, just because we briefly went over how these modules work. So the theme panel, 
looks very complicated, but a lot of them are really simple. And a lot of them are just options for the sake of options. I'm gonna go over the most important ones. So we have the header section, and as you can see, it's automatically using it from the cloud library, which to access your cloud library, you just come over to the cloud templates, and as you can see, we have a bunch of them from default pro. And as you can see, we have this header template. You can view what the template looks like, and as you can see, it's this content right here. This is the header style that it's worked, and you can edit the template to customize it to your liking. Or you could choose to not use a template, in which case if you do this, you'll have default header styles that you can then customize and modify to your liking. Personally, I am a fan of using the cloud templating system for most of the major components. And the reason for that is, is it honestly just saves you time. If you have a website that you're looking to deploy very quickly, instead of going around and messing through all the theme options, you can go ahead and download one of the pre-made templates, and there are a lot of them. For instance, if you just look on the add new, you'll get a nice new pop-up window right here, and there are 78 different header styles to choose from. And that is quite extensive. You can effectively merge and add whatever template style you want. So let's say I wanna use this header template 64 that was in the Gossip Pro theme. I'll go on here, and then I did not activate these, this theme yet, but if you did activate your theme, <laughs> you'll be able to easily download it. But the point is, is you can easily import whatever templates you want, and you can import them from any themes to allow you to easily customize. If you don't wanna use the cloud template library, you could just go ahead and use the standard style method, which can get you a nice basic layout, but none of them are too appealing because they are really basic and they're not using the builder. So if you turn this off, then you just get the limited options. You could set your logo, so you could just use a text logo. Keep in mind, this doesn't work if you have a cloud library template up here. The logo for mobile is the mobile header logo, and I'm gonna show you briefly what this mobile header looks like on this design. And then we're just gonna set it to a Motorola G4. And as you can see, it's very basic, but it does its job. You have an off canvas menu, and you could just have a background image, and you have the exact same thing for your search bar. For your sign in and join menu, you could choose to enable or disable it in the header. If you're curious what this looks like, it's this little bar up here where it says, it'll say your username. It won't always say your email. It's gonna be whatever nice name that you choose to display, and it has a log out button. And then you could choose to enable the iOS bookmarklet. iOS bookmarklets are basically just the favicons that when a user on a iOS device saves it and adds it to the home screen, it'll be the icon that displays. And you can add any of them in here. And this does work even if you use the site icon feature in the customizer. The footer is exactly like the, cloud, the header. It uses the cloud library, but if you don't wish to use that, you can disable it. So if you disable it, you could choose the general style that you're looking to go for. As you can see, this is roughly what the cloud library was, is this style one. And then you could choose to enable things like the Instagram footer, which will add the Instagram section immediately above your footer. This is useful if you're going for a more blog-oriented design or you're somebody who uses a lot of interior design or you'd like to showcase your art or your photography blog. That's can be really useful. A lot of people like to use Instagram widgets to showcase their work in addition to the content that they're trying to write and promote. The footer info just allows you to modify the general block that appears down here. And the footer background, you can set a background image. And then sub footer is the copyright footer down here. You can modify any of these. Remember though, if you have a cloud template enabled, everything disappears. The ads section is really large, but it's basically the exact same thing in different spots. So if you go to the header ad, we're just gonna demonstrate this. You could choose to add either your AdSense code, any other third-party code, so no matter where, if you're using Mediavine, Sovereign, any of the major networks, you'll paste the code in here. But if you're using Google Ads, then you have a bit of flexibility. So if you wanna use Google Ads, you could choose to paste your script in. You'll have to make sure that's using the auto size, which it should by default now. And then you could choose the AdSense size that is displayed for each of the mobile device types. This allows you to get a little bit more granularity with your advertisements because Google Ads with their auto resize functionality sometimes don't always fit the container properly. I've seen some scenarios where a container will only fit a 200 by 200 ad but the auto size unit is trying to put a 300 by 600 ad and then it's just feeding its way down the content. 
So this allows you to eliminate that. It also allows you to choose higher performing AdSense size units. For instance, if it's going in the header and you support a 970 width ad, you can go ahead and put that in there. You can also choose to use 970 by 250 ad if your header will support it. Keep in mind this does support regional ad sizes as well, which will vary depending on your market. The only other thing of note in here is you could choose to add a little title, which will appear directly above the advertisement, and it'll look just like this. And it will just paste this little text above it and to illustrate, hey, this is an advertisement. And that can be a good thing to do if you're trying not to confuse your audience. As you can see right here, it's just advertisement above the little ad that's put in the sidebar. You can choose if you want to enable this or not. I prefer having a little method there to indicate to the audience that, hey, this is an advertisement. That way they'll know and that way they don't misclick it. It's also just a good way to be transparent with your viewers. The template settings, again, this is just allows you to modify basic templates. So by default, if you use an imported demo, it will import a cloud template that you can enable. But if you choose to use the theme template, it will automatically allow you to change the display. These are very basic settings. If you're not using the cloud template, what you'll find is a lot of the styles for your archives are gonna look really basic. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but you lose a lot of flexibility that you gain using the cloud library. So just keep this in mind if you choose to not use the cloud library and use the default settings, you're going to have some limitations on, your, on what you can use to design your pages. You could choose to modify certain aspects of the page. You could choose to enable smart sidebar. This is basically going to work if you're not using the cloud template. A smart sidebar just means it's a sticky sidebar. It's what allows this thing to scroll as you scroll down the page. The breadcrumbs allow you to choose or enable or disable the breadcrumb path right here. This should work if you're using Yoast SEO without any problem and Yoast SEO will add the markup necessary for their breadcrumbs to work. The image loading is their lazy load functionality. I'm going to start off by saying that this is not a very good functionality. I do recommend using a plugin that we've covered on the channel before, like lazy load optimized images or A3 lazy load. The primary reason for that is, is if for whatever reason, maybe you have a really large page layout, if you have the lazy loading animation and the images aren't managed to be downloaded in two seconds, they will fail to download. As it mentions right here, the animation effect will be canceled. I'm not a fan of this loading system. I wouldn't recommend that you use it for your website because you're going to cause some issues for your users on slower connections or if you have really large page layouts. Just use a proper lazy loading plugin to handle the images and it should work without an issue. The only other thing you can do here is if you're not using the cloud, cloud templates, you can choose to force full width which is basically just a fancy way of choosing to stretch the container. You could choose to stretch the container to a certain pixel width, or you could choose to just make the template full width, but leave the content the same way it is. This can help if you're trying to design for larger screen sizes. For instance, I have an ultra wide display, so using the standard internet on here is not always the easiest thing to do. But if you use this, it will try to stretch the content and fit it so that way it looks a little bit more natural. Um, what I will say is typically anybody using a very large display is already aware that most websites don't properly support it. So you shouldn't go designing your screen for very, your website for very, very large displays because number one, the sheer audience that has a very large display is quite small, but you just get used to it. Most people using multiple display setups or very large display setups, even some people who use TVs, they know that they're mostly using it for multitasking to have multiple windows up. And then if you game on it naturally, you're, you're going to experience just the sheer size of the game and the stretchiness that comes with it. But you shouldn't mess around too much with the stretch settings for your website. It's just not very good for your design. The category section, this is just like the other templating sub sections, except you can modify them per category. So some other themes on ThemeForce called these mini sites. Um, this is basically the exact same concept. You have a category, let's say it's this architecture one. You could choose to modify how it looks, how it loads, and you could choose to have a background color instead of an image for the background. 
and you can also choose a category tag color for the post page. So basically this just is a nice way of adding a nice little bit of flair to separate your categories. So what's the one I have on this one? Music. I'll go ahead and see if I can add this for the demo. We'll just click save. So that way you can get a feel for it. And it makes it blue. It's basically just a nice way that allows you to customize your categories to make them feel like separate pages instead of something generic. One thing to keep in mind is under the actual category section, there is no options to modify it. They all have to be done through the theme panel. A lot of other themes allow you to modify it directly on the category. This is not one of them. You also need to keep in mind that your limitations are really going to be restricted if you're using the cloud library. You could choose to overwrite this by, in, by instead of choosing inherit from global settings to use theme templates. And this allows you to further modify it to change the style that it loads, the way that it's shaped out on the page. But again, you really want to be using the cloud library if you can. So one thing I just recommend you do is if you're going to go with the cloud library, make multiple different templates and then assign them to each category. And that should get you the style that you're looking for. Under the post settings, you can enable the general model image. Basically what this means, you click an image and it comes up like this. Depending on what you want to do and how you want your pages to look, you can enable or disable this. I'm not too much of a fan of every image being a gallery, but some people are. You can also just disable article schema. Um, if you're using an SEO plugin, Yoast SEO, SEO Press, all in one, ones that add article schema, you could choose to disable this so that way it's not conflicting in any way. But there's not really any concern if you don't turn this off necessarily. And then you could choose the default post template. So this is just the default template. If you're converting a website over to newspaper, this is what the template's going to look like for all of those previous posts. But if you're just starting fresh, this is just a default and you can modify it by editing the individual post. In fact, we'll do that real quick. You just quickly come over to the post and then you'll scroll all the way down and then you could choose the post template. What's great about this is if you're trying to make content that has a featured video instead of a featured image, you could choose style 10 or 11, which really do highlight that this is a video and it's video content. They look very newsworthy. And you can modify other items such as the subtitle, adding a source and a via little tag on the bottom and so on and so forth. You could choose the do the modify post and custom post type settings. Basically, this is just allows you to turn off certain meta items, which is like your view counter, your comment count. You could choose to enable or disable tags. Only thing to keep in mind is if you are using a cloud library template, this will not overwrite those. You'll have to modify them by editing the template directly. So if I want to turn off, let's say the uh, post view counter, because post view counters are kind of gimmicky, but it depends on what you're going for in your design. You'll just come over here. You'll, mod you'll click on the icon. You can choose to click on any real item on here. And then you just select to delete it. Or you can modify where the data is coming from. For instance, you could say to use theme post views, which is the view counter in the theme, or you can use the WP post views plugin. If you have Jetpack installed, you can also choose to use Jetpack. But if you don't, you just hit the delete item and you'll get rid of it real quick because we are not a fan of this item. And there we go. Now view counter is gone and the post looks great. Um, back to where we were in the theme settings, you featured images, you could just choose to enable or disable it. Again, this is gonna depend if you're using a cloud template or not. Pretty much everything in this section will be cloud template depending. The one thing I do recommend though is for the is to enable the Ajax view counter if you're using a view counter. If you're trying to use view counters, I recommend you use the Jetpack stats one because then you're offloading the processing to Jetpack servers. But if you absolutely want to use the native view counter, make sure it's Ajax. Otherwise, any caching plugin or server side caching like Varnish will not work. And then under the video settings, you could choose to enable a floating player on the bottom right if you have a featured video. Some people like this. It's done very commonly on news sites like CNS, CNN, so on and so forth. You just scroll down the page and the video player will scroll down with you. I find it a bit obnoxious, but if you want to give someone the flexibility, by all means, go ahead and enable it. The 
block settings are really basic. So one thing that you can do is modify the header type. Blocks are when we were on that home page, and I'll just show you again, where they were just the default styling for your front end blocks that are loading. The blocks are just the, really they're just what's showing you with the post. This is the block header right here. You could choose to modify the way that this looks. So for instance, if you don't want to include a line, you could just modify it and select it to have the basic text and then other categories next to it. It depends on the design that you're going for. I'm not a fan of the default block header one. I think that having the line makes it look a little cheesy and generic, but block header two is much more clean. And then you could choose to enable category filters by modifying the page template. I will go ahead and illustrate this for you now. And I'm gonna do it for my first block. So we set the default block header to block header two, which does modify this. Keep in mind that that doesn't work for all of the templates that you're importing. But you'll go over here and then you'll click the filter and then you could choose to the categories and you could choose to enable post ID filters, authors, you could just choose to filter my categories and this will give you all these nice categories right here. And we could just choose if we only want like architecture to show up and so on and so forth. I wouldn't mess around too heavily with these options. One thing that you'll get really frustrated with this is you could choose to enable the filter and only show the following IDs. But by default, if you don't do that, you're going to get every single category as the options that drop down. My issue with this is it gets really cluttered and the mega menu that this theme includes is the same way. So for sites that have a lot of content, you're gonna need to customize each of these blocks individually by clicking show the following IDs. You're gonna need to take that time on your own, but it's, it's just a little tedious if you have a very large website that you're converting. But if you're converting a very large website, this is something that's probably really low on the uh, pecking order of things to fix. You could choose to enable or disable thumbnails that are auto-generated by the theme. So if you've ever looked at a WordPress website in the back end, you upload an image and you notice that it does a lot of different image resizing, that's because the theme is declaring that it needs those sizes. And the reason that they do this is for really just optimizing the front end. Having 15 different resized images in your server is not necessarily a performance issue but serving a 1920 by 1080 image in a spot that's only designed for a 300 by 300 image is a major performance issue on the front end and your users could experience some really slow delivery speeds. So what you should keep in mind is you can disable these thumbnails, but keep in mind that if you do this, you first of all, you'll need to regenerate the thumbnails on your server. But more importantly, if you disable one that's being used for a block type that you're using, then you're gonna have some performance issues. The only other thing that you can really modify in here is to enable retina images. And my general stance on retina images is the only time you'll need to use this is if you have a very niche use case. Maybe you're a photographer or you have an art blog and you wanna have really nice high quality images. That's the only real time you should be using them. The problem with retina images is they're simply, you're doubling the amount of images on your site. So if you have 16 resized images, so that way you're serving the perfect pixel sized images on the front end, and you wanna show them all as retina as well, you're now serving 32 resized thumbnails for every image and one that is twice as large so that way it can be scaled down. The performance headache is really minor, but you're gonna notice that you're consuming a lot more storage on your host. Depending on who you're hosted with, this can be quite expensive, and maybe your only option to get more storage on your existing host is to upgrade your plan. So I'm not a real big fan of retina images, particularly because most displays simply aren't retina enabled. Even on a 2K resolution display, an average resized thumbnail still looks great on the average website. So I wouldn't worry too much about enabling retina. Category tags, you could choose to hide or show category tags on certain block types and grids. I'm, there's nothing really more to it than that. And then you could choose to show the meta info on different blocks. So if you're using the date, my general advice is show the modified date. 
because a post that displays that it was published in 2014 on your homepage would look pretty off-putting saying that the page has not been updated. However, if you show the modified date, you're telling users while this post was published in 2014, it's been updated recently, so it's still relevant. Then you can do the seven day post sorting feature and so on and so forth. The background section strictly allows you to place a background image for your page. You'll almost never use this section. Background images are very odd in most situations. Unless you're doing some sort of advertisements, there's never a real reason to have a background image ever. Just use the standard color that, sits your, that suits your design palette and you'll be fine. Mobile menu and search background. This allows you to set the search background and the mobile item just like this. So when you click this, there is this background image right here. And it's also the item for the background menu only on mobile devices. Again, I'm just a fan of using a flat color, uh, but if you want to have a nice design or you want to incorporate some branding in here, this could be quite useful. For instance, if you're a gaming website, you could put a screenshot from a game like Overwatch or put out your favorite character on there, so on and so forth. And then you could do the exact same thing for the join background, which is when you sign, when you click your sign in link, then the box loads that which is the exact same image will appear there. I wouldn't play around with this too much. Under the excerpts, you can modify how the excerpts work. Basically, you can choose to show the title, modify the title length and the excerpt length. There we go. The content length is what it's known as, it's, but it's the excerpt. You can also modify how excerpts are generated. You could just do it on words or on letters. What that basically means is, is if you choose to show 20 words, it'll sh if you type in the word 20 for the excerpt, It'll either be 20 words or you could choose 20 letters. This is important mostly because I prefer using words as the excerpt. If you choose letters, words can be cut off and replaced with the triple dots or the continue reading button, whatever you have it set to. The words is honestly, it's a great option and it's the default option as well. I wouldn't modify any of these settings just to save yourself some time unless you have a very niche use case or if you have a language that is quite long to spell simple words that this theme may not have been designed for originally. Speaking of different languages, translations panel is super simple. You could choose to load a translation from any of the, I think it's like 80 or 90 languages. Oh yeah, they're up to 90 languages now. You'll go ahead and you'll click and it will load your translation in. You can also then choose to modify the translation if it's incorrect or oftentimes what's wrong with these translations is the grammar. But if you don't want to load a template, you're free to just go into this box and change what the text says. Even if you're using a language that's exactly the same as the template, let's say that you're using English, you could choose to change by, so instead of by Scott Hartley as the little line for the author, you could choose to say from Scott Hartley. And this allows you to get some easy customization going on on the front end to modify some very frequently used template items. I don't really modify this myself, but if depending on your language or how you want to style and fit your brand, this is an easy way to do that. Theme colors, I'm not going to touch on this too much, but basically you just modify the colors for a variety of sections and for most of your website. Under the theme of fonts, you could choose to either import a font from Typekit, Google Fonts, or upload a font in the .wav format. My general advice is if you can find it on Google Fonts, use Google Fonts. And my reasoning for that is quite simple. The fact that you only upload .wav formats, which is the most widely supported, means that you're missing out on using the later newer format of .wav2, which is a smaller font size for exactly the same font. It's just a better compression algorithm. You will also lose backwards compatibility because certain browsers don't support .wav. Notably, I think it was like older iOS devices that were depending on Safari. They don't support anything other than like TTF or SVG. I, I just use Google Fonts in all honestly. I don't even use Typekit most of the time because Google Fonts are just much more efficient. And if you wanna host them locally, Google Fonts makes it a lot easier. Typekit doesn't make any of that easy. And uploading them individually and only using .wav is less efficient than just serving them from Google Fonts with .wav2 and to automatically optimize for the end user. Under the custom code section, you could just paste in custom HTML, custom JavaScript, and then you can also modify CSS. If you're not good with 
CSS and you just wanted to change something for maybe your desktop users, you can paste it in here and it will automatically add the media queries for the pixel size that it mentions here. So this theme defines a desktop device as anything that has 1141 pixels in width. So if you want to make it text in here, let's say black, you would just do dot body, font, dash color. I'm just giving an example, saying it's a black and it would only do it for desktop. If you want to make a global CSS change, you have to do it up here. This is basically the exact same thing as your custom code section, but it allows you to paste JavaScript and Google Analytics where the recommendation is. It's either right before the head or right before the body tag. But if you've ever seen my site kit video, I just recommend using Google site kit. If you can, it automatically adds a script and it's just much better. The social networks tab. This is a global setting. So we need to clarify how this section works. Number one, you don't need to add any here, anything in here that you're not necessarily using. You shouldn't need to add the YouTube API for most functionality. They have a tutorial on how to generate the API key and why you may need to use it. You'll just click this and follow its instructions. The Instagram API is exactly the same, but if you're using the footer section where you're using your Instagram profile, you'll need to add the, you'll have to connect the Instagram account here. You'll just click it, you'll sign in, and then you'll have to authorize it, and then it should work without an issue. Then you finally have the social networks tab. This section I'm gonna to touch on just briefly. So you can modify certain items for the rel attributes. You don't really need to do this. I don't ever recommend no following your social platforms solely because your social media platforms, you typically want to tell Googlebot that, hey, this is related and this is my profile. Recommend you just leave it at the default here. And then you can paste your links in this section. These are global options that you can use for the header, the footer social media, the off canvas media right here. Let's just say I remove Vimeo for instance. I'm gonna reload this page now and then I'm gonna click on my menu. And now Vimeo is gone. It is a global option. So you add what you support here and no more and no less. My general advice is you obviously will never have all of these social media platforms and some of them aren't even really social media. For instance, Windows. What is Windows? No idea, but it's there. Or Yahoo, if you have Yahoo. And then some of them are just really odd. Your mail will include a mail to link. So if somebody clicks it on their mobile device, for instance, it'll open up their Gmail app and they could begin writing you an email. Use these as much as you want. Just keep in mind, you don't need to make platforms for all of them. Custom post types and taxonomies. If you have a custom post type and it's not WooCommerce, they will show up here. And this will allow you to make some of these exact same setting modifications that you saw in the template and post settings option. By default, there are no real custom post types enabled. So just keep in mind that if you are registering them and maybe you have one for your sponsored post or your guest post, you'll include it and you can modify these settings specific to those posts. Finally, you have the import and export section. This is the last real option in here. This allows you to just simply export your theme options and import them. This is good if you're trying to back up your website, but it's even better if you're trying to duplicate your layouts onto other websites. Maybe you have three or four websites that you're building at the exact same time for different niches. You could just export your theme options and import them into the other site and it should work fabulously. Just keep in mind, if you don't also import the cloud templates into there, which you'll have to use by just copying and pasting really, then you'll have to go ahead and then they won't really register and run correctly. It'll also keep a theme panel settings backup. This is just a backup of every time you save the panel. So there's one from 422, which is when I first installed the theme onto the staging server. And then all the modifications that I was making today, every time you save, it will make another backup. This is good if you're trying to undo a mistake that you've made. This is also a fairly new option. And then you have the final option to reset your theme settings. You click it, it's like running WP reset. It will wipe everything. It will set it back to square one and you'll be able to go back and customize it as you wish. I would use this on a staging site just to demonstrate some of the options, but I would never recommend you ever touch this in a million years on a live site unless you absolutely need to. If you have any questions about the theme, please feel free to ask in the comments below. 
I'll make a video on how to optimize the theme, of course, but it's, a, it's honestly a great theme. It's just a matter of whether it has the features that you're looking for and the aesthetic that you're wanting to, to go for. The only other thing I suggest is if you're using a, if you're a business type website, and I know there are business themes that they have demos for, I don't recommend using this for a business type website. You would be much better off using something like Divi or Avada or anything that's business first. That way you have the flexibility and there are more blocks and modules that you can customize in those themes to display your content. Otherwise, thank you all so much for watching. Make sure you like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.